Joanne, and welcome to the show, Flourish. We are so grateful that you've invited us to be with you in your family room today. Well, this is the season three of Flourish, and this season we're talking about family. Family is God's beautiful masterpiece, and unfortunately, because God loves and honors a family so much, the enemy, Satan, is constantly targeting us. But we overcome in the love and the faith of Jesus. So today we're actually focusing on marriage. So who better to have with me than my beloved husband, Tom? So Tom, welcome to Flourish. Oh, it's great to be with my amazing wife. And we're going to talk about some fun things today and some things from God's word on having a good marriage. That's right. That's right. You know, marriage is God's highest and most elevated relationship of all creation of all earth. And he uses marriage to reflect the relationship that he wants us to have with him. Right. In fact, in the Bible, in the New Testament, marriage is what exemplifies our relationship with Jesus. So um, as we talk about marriage today, we're going to, first of all, we're going to talk about the great part of it and what God initially intended marriage to be. Marriage is supposed to be between one man and one woman. God wants that marriage to last forever. That marriage is supposed to be a, a safe place where the husband protects the wife, the wife respects the husband. All these things should be in perfect balance. I say should be because unfortunately we live in a fallen world. And because of that, ah, sin tarnishes everything. That's right. So today we want to talk about how do we overcome in Christ? How do we have a set apart, wonderful marriage in a fallen world? So... What should we talk about first, Tom? Well, I think a little bit about us and then, uh, and by the way, we want to talk also about what happens uh, if you've had a rough marriage and what happens if you lost a marriage, there's been divorce, there's lots of situations, yes. but we know this, Jesus can redeem them all. That's right. And so, um, yeah, we were married 41 years ago <laughs> and we have six children, 13 grandchildren. Uh, it has been an amazing and, excuse ride. Excuse me, one more on the and way. And one more Almost on the way. 14 grandkids. That's right. And it's been an amazing ride, just an uh, incredible uh, relationship of love. And we're as happy as we were the day we got married, even more so. That's so right. it gets better. That's right. But all of it goes back to Jesus. We keep tethered, anchored to Jesus, and He's the one that really can improve your marriage. Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, part of the problem with the fall is God initially designed us, of course, to have an unbroken relationship with Him, with mm -hmm. God. And He also wanted us to have an unbroken relationship with each other, with a oneness that separates us from all other relationships. But what happens when sin enters in is we often become very self-focused. In fact, when we look in the garden at Adam and Eve, we see that when they sinned, mm -hmm. you know, that's when they discovered that they were naked and they were ashamed of that. And what is the first thing they do is they try to cover themselves. Right. They don't try to cover each other. They're only thinking about themselves. So selfishness um, is a big hindrance in marriage. Right. And one of the things we need to work toward in a biblical marriage is thinking of one another as more important than yourself, which that's, is a command, second commandment that Jesus That's gives. right. And uh, we saw in Genesis 1 that we are created in the image of God. So it wasn't just men that were created in the image mm -hmm. of God, not just women. Both of us were. Both of us were created in the image of God. And together, uh, the first assignment for mankind was for a couple to rule over the earth, subdue it. That's right. And of course, sin entered and everything changed. But God created man and women to have a beautiful relationship. They are equal in essence, mm -hmm. different in function. Correct. So today, I think there's a lot of gender confusion globally about there's no difference whatsoever. Just biologically looking at each other, we are different, mm -hmm. but we are equal in essence different in function, right, Joanne? Exactly. In fact, one of the things I love to look at is when God created Eve, first of all, Adam was by himself. He was given the role of naming all the animals and God allowed him to see that he was the only one without a mate. A zebra, Mr. Zebra had right. a Mrs. Zebra. Mr. Giraffe had a Mrs. Giraffe. Everyone had a mate except for, except for man. That's right. So Adam realized that he was incomplete. And so then when God brings him Eve, how does he do it? He puts Adam to sleep, 
He takes one of his ribs and out of that rib, he fashions Eve. Out of Adam's own flesh, he creates mm. his wife. And then um, he brings her to Adam and Adam is undone at the completeness that he feels when this woman, his wife, comes into his life. And so then together they are given the mandate to control the earth. Not each other, but the earth. And so when the fall happened, unfortunately what happens is so often they try to get control each other. In many societies we see the men really trying to control mm -hmm. women. And that goes against how God created us to be. So it's really only in Jesus that we find the fulfillment of those That's roles right. coming reunited again, where we can look out. So one true. For another. And you know, God loves marriage. He performed the first one, and He took a man That's and right. a woman. He brought uh, Eve to Adam, and it says in Genesis two, Adam. He says, "This is the bone of my bones. This is part of my side." And somehow, maybe the excitement doesn't seem to come out in that phrase, you know. Uh, but he was just saying, wow, he, he was yes. imme immediately attracted to his wife and, um, and they went from there. Yeah. So. yeah. And you know, and the difference between man and woman is intentional. God uses that in a way to where we complete one another. And in a sense, we can say that man was incomplete until woman came along and together they make a whole. Mm -hmm. And boy, we sure see that in our own marriage, don't we, Tom? Right. I will say that as a woman, I can be more emotional and Tom brings me such stability. Um, if we've got a situation going on in, in life, I can become very emotionally charged by it. Mm. And then Tom will come in and he will bring such calm, such perspective, and it really helps kind of lower my emotions. And I don't mean anger. I just mean maybe I'm crying mm -hmm. or um, maybe I'm just so outside of the box of where I need to be that Tom can pull me right back in and then I can see clearly. And sometimes men are not, are not emotional enough. They're too pointed. They're too literate. And I remember, Joanne, once when with the six children, I can remember coming home and uh, so I was a pastor, six children. I remember you were stirring spaghetti sauce and the kids were running around. And I remember looking up and we had a ceiling fan and there was a pair of little kids underwear on the ceiling fan going <laughs> around. <laughs> and I remember uh, you said, I, I just can't get things done. I, I, it's just, there's too much with the kids. I don't know what's the matter with me today. And I logically sat there and said, okay, I think this is what you can do. You can set the kids here, give them a project, go over and do this do this, do this, and everything will be done. Don't worry about it. And I remember you said, thank you that you told me what I needed to do with my life. I guess I just couldn't figure it out on my own. <laughs> and I realized I was being logical, but you weren't looking for a solution. You weren't looking for an answer. You were looking for compassion. For compassion and because right. we're not often emotionally as yeah. balanced, I was missing it completely. Exactly, exactly. Man, again, we bring balance one to another and we need each other. God wants us in marriage to depend on each other. But in order to depend on each other, we need to have trust. That's right. And I will have to say that we've been blessed. I We trust each other implicitly. That's right. You know, we've been blessed with a great marriage. But maybe you're sitting there watching this and saying, ah, we don't have that. So how do we get that? How do we establish trust? Mm. How do we get to the place where I um, find that my husband emotionally will support me? What do you think, Tom? What should we talk about? There's a couple in the Bible. Yes, there's an amazing couple in the Bible. And, and there are many in the Old Testament, too. There's Abraham and Sarah. There is Ruth and Boaz. There's uh, Jacob and Rebecca. And so uh, amazing couples in the Bible. But in the New Testament... There was a couple, uh, and their name. Well, let's let's talk about the bad couple Ooh, first. There was a bad couple. There first. was a bad couple. <laughs> the bad couple was Ananias and Sapphira. Right. And so the church was young. This is in Acts five, and they're a couple, and they're getting caught up in the church where everybody was following Jesus. They were studying the Bible together. Mm -hmm. They were praying. They were worshiping, but. They decided voluntarily, the people, to just give whatever they had as an offering to the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so Ananias and Sapphira came forward, and they gave money from land that they had sold. 
But the problem was this, they weren't telling the truth. Mm -hmm. It wasn't all the prophets. And so they kept some back for themselves and immediately they were found out and the Lord actually took them home early. And uh, Peter said, day. why did you lie to the Holy Spirit? And so they conspired yeah. together. But the good couple that we'll talk about in the New Testament is Priscilla, was her name, and Aquila. Right. And they accompanied Paul around the world, the Apostle Paul. They're written about in four different books. It's Acts and 1 Corinthians and, and I Romans. think Romans and Timothy. I think it's 1 right. Timothy. And this was like the power couple of the New Testament. So they both taught. Uh, they were Italian Jewish believers from Rome. In fact, there was a young convert and his name was Apollos. And they said he was a great and mighty preacher, but yet he didn't really know all the things of the Lord. And so it ended up that Priscilla and Aquila spent time and they discipled him and they tutored him. Right. And Paul, at the end of their lives said, they risked their lives daily mm -hmm. for me. Yes. Yeah. And so here they are, these saints in the New Testament, God's using them to help build the church all around the known world. Here's the amazing thing. They died together yeah. as martyrs. The same day they lost their lives mm -hmm. together right. as servants of the Lord. So great marriage, committed thoroughly to serve the Lord, mm -hmm. and then martyrs together. I don't know of any other couple that I've ever read about that experienced what they did. You know, and another thing, it's an incredible couple and, and someone we want to emulate. The beautiful thing, too, about Priscilla and Aquila is whenever you <coughs> see one name mentioned, you see both of them mentioned. Yeah. I don't, are they ever mentioned in Scripture no. separately? Yet, no, they are always mentioned together. We hear about Abraham and Sarah. Mm -hmm. We hear about you know, all these different couples, Ruth and Boaz, right. often named together, but more often than not named separately. But Priscilla and Aquila, their names are always together. That's right. Uh, I mentioned this in our last program, um, the, the first of this season, that when Tom asked me to marry him, I was 19 years old. He was 23. I'll never forget, he got on his knees and told me how much he loved me. And he asked me, he had talked to my parents first and asked for my hand in marriage, which is a very American That's custom. Right. And got the blessing from my parents. And then, of course, came to me, dropped down on his one knee and um, proposed and asked if I would marry him. And then he said this to me. He said, Joanne, marry me and I'll show you the world. And, you know, I, I, I remember thinking, oh, that would be fun. Never had I thought at 19 to see the whole world. In fact, I don't even know if you had thought to see the Hadn't whole world. Hadn't been out of the country. Time. Yeah. But didn't realize at that time what a prophetic statement that was. Because like Priscilla and Aquila, Tom and I have always served Jesus together. First, Tom was a pastor the first 20 years of our marriage. And then the last 20 years of our marriage, we have taken Jesus all throughout the Middle East and Central Asia, in Europe. And so we have been all over the world together, sharing the gospel of Christ, the highest and the greatest honor. And so we don't have a lot of specific lessons in scripture about Priscilla and Aquila. We know they had a good marriage. We, we assume mm -hmm. that because they're so connected and, and they're serving Jesus so wholeheartedly as a couple. But we've learned some things that are biblical principles that we'd like to share with you. Uh, one of the things that Tom and I have committed to from day one in our marriage is communicating well. Yes. Um, there is not one thing that Tom doesn't know about me and That's vice right. versa. That's right. We communicate thoroughly and completely. And I'll give you an example. One time, uh, one of our daughters had a friend over and they had had a little quarrel. These were best little friends, but they were young. They were probably about seven years old and had a little quarrel. And this was back in the days um, here in America when you would call on the telephone and if the people weren't home, you'd leave a voicemail on their message machine. And so I called the mom and I told her, you know, I want to apologize for what happened with Lindsay and Katie and blah, 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 you know, left the message. And I thought I hung up the phone, but I didn't. <laughs> and so I clicked and Tom and I are in the, the room and we were talking about this dilemma with our two daughters, with our daughter and her friend, having no idea that the whole conversation was being recorded <laughs> on our friend's machine. And we're talking about what we think our daughter did, what we think their daughter did and how we should solve this. We prayed together. I mean, y'all, this conversation went on for probably 
five minutes mm -hmm. that was recorded. And later th that day, I got a call from the mom. And this is what she said to me. She said, Joanne, you know, when you called and left that message, I don't think you realized that you didn't hang up the phone and your entire conversation with Tom was recorded. She said, I want you to know I saved that conversation. I played it for my, my husband. I, I played it for my daughter and we wanted to show that, I wanted to show them how well you two communicated. And that was the first time that someone told us that. Yeah. We were shocked. And then, then I'm thinking, oh my goodness, what did I say? <laughs> what did Tom say? That's right. But the key is communication just keeps your relationship alive and growing. We want to encourage you to communicate in love one to another. And you know, for some of you, you're saying, oh yeah, this sounds too good to be true. Do they ever not get along? And the answer is yes, that happens. We are fleshly We're creatures. Human. We are. We have a sin nature. And I remember at one point, Joanne's family was visiting and I guess I was just being extremely mm -hmm. insensitive and um, not just putting Joanne first and not listening to her. I don't know what was going on with me, but Joanne didn't feel like it was time to talk to me because her parents were there and that might be a little, you know, embarrassing. You know, if we go in the back room, excuse us, we need to talk. So she wrote me right. a letter of things that she thought mm -hmm. that I was doing wrong. And um, it was a very lengthy document, actually. <laughs> and the, 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 it was numbered, the things that I had done wrong. Right. And I, I'll always remember the number. It was 30 things that I had done wrong that, that had offended upset. her. And so as I read the first, I said, okay, Holy Spirit, okay, speak to me through this. First one, read it. Oh, yeah, I can see that. <laughs> Second one, ooh, yeah, I do that too. And I went all the way through. And really, every one of those things I was guilty of. And so I went and I asked Joanne to forgive me. And I think, hey, listen, if couples say, and she said, of course, of course. And I remember she said, are you going to write me a note? And I said, no, this was about me. This is things I'm doing wrong. But I think if couples expect that they're going to get married and there's no conflict, they'll never be mm -hmm. fighting. That's just wrong. That'll happen in heaven. And so yes. don't let that dislodge your marriage when sin raises its ugly head mm -hmm. because it happens. Mm -hmm. It does. And you know that story. Oh my gosh, I remember that. And I do remember the beginning of the note. I was writing really big. And then by the time I settled down, I was writing, you know, normal. But the thing about that story that, that pierces my heart is how teachable you were, Tom. Mm. You know, he so heard, he listened to what I said, and he could have written me a letter back because there's many things yeah. I've done that are not good either. But he chose to just, he chose the road of forgiveness. And putting one another first. And so when God created Adam and Eve in the garden, the first thing that they had before sin was a perfect relationship with That's God. Right. The second thing they had was a perfect relationship with each other. Then Satan came in, Adam and Eve sinned, sin enters the world and sin separates. Mm -hmm. The first thing that's broken is a relationship with That's God. Right. The second thing that was broken is a relationship with each other. So when Jesus comes along and we find redemption in him, and then he was asked one time by his followers, you know, what, what are the greatest commandments? What should we follow to be one of your followers? Mm -hmm. And Jesus said, the first thing is that you need to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, with everything in your being, reestablishing that relationship that God initially made. And the second thing Jesus said that you need to do is you need to think of one another or think of others is more important than yourself. Think of one another. And so that's reestablishing this relationship mm. that was broken with sin. And so that is what God is trying to do is reunite all of us so that we can get as close to how, how he that's initially right. intended it when he made us. And so if you're sitting listening in your family room, your living room, your car, wherever you are today, and you're thinking, well, my husband or my wife, they're not a believer, but I am. What do I do? How do I handle that if I know Jesus, but they don't? How would you answer that? Wow. Well, you know, uh, a woman can really greatly influence her husband 
to Christ just by the change in her life. And so we know once we come to faith in Christ, the Holy Spirit fills us. Ephesians 1 says that we are sealed in the Spirit. The Spirit is inside of us. So then the fruit of the Spirit starts to come out. And husbands can observe their wives and wives their husbands. We've heard stories both ways where they mm -hmm. saw a difference, their countenance, the way they treat each other. And you know, I think a lot can be said by just uh, about our words, mm -hmm. how we talk to each other. Do we bless each other or do we blast each right, other? Right. Do, we, do we say things that, that are really unkind, that are hard to retrieve. Mm -hmm. we, we can do that. And I know that men and women typically communicate differently. Joanne will like to talk about things and process. Mm -hmm. yes, I and I that. like to think about things. Yep. A lot of times I'll be Fine. quiet and need to go for a walk. But I think, um, I can't remember where I was going with that. But Well, I think what you were saying, we were talking about how our life is a living example yes. to people. <clears throat> and, you know, Jesus says, piggybacking on what you said a moment ago, Jesus says that with our lips we can bless, or with our lips we can curse. That's so right. our words can bring life, or our words <clears throat> can bring death. Um, I'm sure you've had that happen where someone encourages you and says something to you that's so affirming, and it really does make you sit that's up right. straighter and feel better about who you are. Those words brought life. Then someone can say something to you. It can be your spouse or it can be someone else, a friend or a coworker or something. And they say something to you that's just like an arrow to your heart. And boy, that just melts you and you feel mm. like you are smaller. You feel shamed. Those words bring death. That's really true. And so, especially in a marriage, remember we said at the beginning, marriage is the highest relationship that God has given us between a husband and a wife. It's that place where he wants us to be safe, where we can be vulnerable with each other, where we can be known, be known and know the other person, that intimate oneness that's only between a husband and a wife. But if we say words that put each other down, oh my gosh, that's, right. that's going to build distrust not trust. Mm. You know, another thing I've learned, Tom is so good about this, is um, not saying something negative or even correcting each other in public or in front of other people. Um, that's embarrassing. It's an easy way to shame one another yeah. by either putting each other down in front of people or correcting each mm. other. Um, and you are really good about well, not Well, thank you. That, I, don't, I think out. you do that well too. And you know what? Going to the Bible in Ephesians, I love these verses, Ephesians mm. 5, starting verse 21, and this is one that oftentimes women can stumble over. Wait a minute, I'm not sure about that. Mm -hmm. Submit one another, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands as you do yes. the Lord. Well, how, I'm not sure my husband treats me that well. Do I really have to do that? So that seems pretty lofty. That seems pretty high. But this is what God has called husbands to do. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by washing with water through the word. And so God is saying to the woman, submit yourself to your husband. But he's saying to the husband, submit yourself to the, your wife so much that you would be willing to die for her, right. just like Jesus died for you, for the church. So that means if you're walking down the street and, and a bus is coming and it's going to hit, mm -hmm. the husband jumps out mm. to take the hit. He doesn't throw his wife out there. He pulls her back. He, he takes the hit. And so really God's calling the men to do something that is even more right. difficult. Right. And I think that's one of the reasons that Satan has a target, a bullseye, on men's back to, mm -hmm. to break up the marriages. And again, we're talking about family, God's masterpiece, Satan's target. Exactly. And boy, do we see that in marriage. Right. So true. So what Tom just said is exactly right. That's kind of our overarching theme this year for Flourish, and that <clears throat> is family, marriage, children, all of that is God's masterpiece. And so it's Satan's target. Mm. You are God's masterpiece. So that means you are on Satan's dartboard. Mm -hmm. And um, what we would like to do, we have a, just a couple of minutes left, but we really want to pray for you. We want to pray for those of you that are in a marriage. Um, maybe it was arranged. Maybe, maybe it's 
not the, the mate that you chose, or maybe it's different than what you thought it would be. Mm -hmm. We want to pray for you that God will redeem that, that you will find your first love in him <coughs> and then in turn your love for one another because mm -hmm. nothing is um, impossible with God. He can heal any relationship and reestablish it to the way that he wants it to be. We also want to pray for those of you that are, are maybe you're a believer and your spouse is not. Let's pray for the salvation of your spouse, whether that's your husband or your wife. And then if there's anyone listening and you're going, neither one of us know Jesus. We're religious, but we have not embraced Jesus. We think of him as a prophet, but not as a savior. But well, we want to pray for you too, that perhaps Jesus will meet you in your dreams right. and you will come mm. to know Jesus, Messiah, Son of God. So many things we can share, but as we close and go into prayer, just remember this, watch your words mm. between each other. In Psalm 141, it says, set a guard over my lips, O Lord, like a, a sentry guard that, to protect from them coming out and being used as weapons there. We're called to bless, not blast each other. So let's pray. Yes, let's pray. Yes. And I'm going to pray for the husbands first. Lord okay. Jesus, I pray for the men mm -hmm. who are watching this today, Lord, that they would realize that they are blessing themselves by blessing their wives. They're hurting themselves by hurting their wives because they're one together in marriage. Okay. And so, Father, I pray for husbands that you would just mm -hmm. rise up a mighty generation in Iran of men that would love their wives like Christ mm -hmm. loves yes, the church. Father. Let this be a nation that just has model examples of men that are loving their wives as mm -hmm. Jesus loves us so deeply. And Father, we pray for marriages to be healed. We know that um, there are many that are in trouble right now. Lord, we pray for marriages to be healed. And we also pray for those who don't know Jesus and want a great marriage, but it starts being anchored to Jesus. So if you've never trusted Christ, just pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I give you my life. Forgive me of my sins. Take them away. I want to start a new life. I want to follow you, Jesus, my Savior. In your name, amen. Mm. And Father, I want to pray for the wives that are listening out there today. Father, each woman, you see what she is going through right now. You see if she's got a great marriage and if she's mm -hmm. happy and she's flourishing in it. You see the wife that is struggling, um, hurting, maybe in a marriage she didn't choose. Father, we pray that you would heal and redeem every single one of those relationships. Or if there's a woman out there who's single and she's yes. wanting to be married, but mm. she can't find that husband. Father, would you meet her needs as well? Jesus, we ask that in each of these situations, these women that are married, especially for them, that they would love and respect their husbands, that you would reflect to them areas that where they can grow, not just looking how their husband can change, but how you That's want right. to grow them to love their husbands more thoroughly, to respect them, to give them the honor that is due them. And then, Lord, again, for those single women that are out there, would you bring into their path the man that you've chosen for them? Mm -hmm. And more than anything, we pray for every marriage out there that they would become Christ-centered, that they would reestablish that relationship that you designed from the beginning, that their marriage would be one, that it would be unified, separate, set apart, bringing you glory, that together they would fulfill the mandate you have on their life. Mm -hmm. And Father, that um, more than anything, they would come to know you as Savior if they don't yet know you. So we love you, Jesus. We worship you. And we pray in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us here. Tom, Great thank you, friends, for you. joining us here. May the Lord rise up and bless you. May his face shine upon you, and may he be gracious to you. May the Lord put his countenance upon you and give you peace. We'll see you next time.